what I'm going to talk to you about something that in the beginning when I started making art, I didn't really think so much about. I thought that was something that you sort of already knew when you didn't really have to think so much about. I'm going to talk to you about adapting to your target audience. And live at Stalin, or the LARP workshop, that's working with, mostly working with LARP as an educational tool, I would say that we are experts in doing LARPs for 10 to 17 year olds, because we've done so many of them, and we've met so many 10 to 17 year olds. But it's also a group that's defined by, they usually have LARP before, and they have not chosen to LARP. We come there, and their teacher have chosen for them to LARP. They have to go to this, because it's part of their education. It's a very specific audience. And at one point during our sort of journey towards becoming this LARP company, uh, we sat down and we're talking about, uh, we're talking about evaluating the kind of games we do. And we're talking about how can we get better and what's not working so well right now. And one of my fantastic co-workers, who are actually sitting in this audience, that is Teresa, she asked us this question and she asked us, who are we making these LARPs for? And the question, I mean, it could be quite simple. Of course, we know we're making LARPs for young adults, for kids, and making them so they will learn something. But the question was rather about, sometimes when we make LARPs, why we're working with this is just because we love LARP. And we might have been doing LARPs, LARPs that we actually found interesting rather than maybe were adapted to what they found interesting. So the question was about, what are we thinking when we do these LARPs? Because sometimes we're actually making them because we find this kind of subject interesting. We want to explore this. We find this kind of meta technique interesting. That's why we put it in the game. Not maybe because it suits the audience. So, we started thinking about this, and at this point, uh, when we're making LARPs, of course we think about who are we making them for. Well, is this what I find interesting, or is this what my audience would find interesting? Or what they actually have some games <coughs> from? But of course, we are not there yet. This week, we were preparing for uh, a three-week-long summer LARP that we're going to start next week. And we were preparing this with our summer employees. They are between 17 and 19 years old. They, some of them have not LARPed before, and they're going to work as game masters. So this week we've been sort of training them as game masters. And we did this by starting every morning with a 15 minute long LARP for them to sort of start the morning with LARPing. And one morning uh, we started the LARP with, uh, with the, the question, who here have seen the movie Together, which is a very famous Swedish movie? And these 15 to 17 year olds, they were sort of looking at us like, we yeah, have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and we were like, okay, uh, you know, like 70s living together collective. They were sort of like, no. And I was like, okay. <laughs> uh, all right, where do we go from there? And we're like, okay, you're living together in a house and you sort of share things and stuff, okay? Um, <coughs> They had no idea. This movie is really famous, but we didn't really think about that they, it, the movie was actually produced 12 years ago. They were like 17 years, seven years old. Of course, they haven't seen the movie. But we were just like fastly doing something that we found was sort of very normal and interesting. But uh, they had no clue. It worked out fine anyway. We had a lot of fun with the game, but it's always harder if you don't adapt the game to the audience. So of course you should do games that you find interesting, but you need to adapt it to the people you're going to make it for. Because otherwise the game won't be interesting even if you think so when you design it. So, um, you might start out in different sort of viewpoints. You might do a game and you have no definition of the audience. Say, you're making a game and you, you think like, oh, the people who, who will come to this game, they will come because they find this game interesting. So you don't start with defining the audience before you make the game. And that's okay. That's a lot of times people do that. But I also think that even if you do that, even if you don't have 
an idea about, uh, if you don't say you have no definition of your target audience, I think you have in your head what kind of people you serve <coughs> will come to your game. And I recommend that you sort of think a little bit more about that than just feel like whoever finds this interesting will come. Uh, another kind of perspective is that you want to make a game for someone. You have a, a target audience that you want to reach out to. And the third is that you actually get commissioned to do a game for someone. So for example, you might uh, want to do a game for a group of politicians. Or you get commissioned to do a game for, say, 13 to 14 year olds who are making this kind of fun TV thing with this game. Uh, and then, of course, it's the next level. You can adapt an existing game to this audience, or you write a new game for this audience. So, you want to like, get to know this audience that you're doing, making this game for. And some different ways of doing this, there's of course many other ways, is uh, by experience. Okay, I've done a lot of games for these kind of people. I've done a lot of games for 14, 13 years old before. I know a lot about them. Okay, I base this on my experience of what works and what doesn't work. Or, you can ask for a mentor, someone who, who's done these kind of games with these kind of audience before. So ask for help. Will this work? Is this a good way of thinking when I'm saying this game? And then, of course, meeting the audience before you're making the game. And that can be done in many different levels. You can do this by uh, having a discussion with Sort of like, I'm thinking about doing a game like this and that. Would that work? But you can also do it by uh, game testing. That you actually you have a concept. You sort of have an idea about the game. And it will sort of work with trying it out with the, the audience. Try it out. I severely recommend to game test your games if you're going to do it on a bigger scale. It's a lot of fun. And it's also really good for the game. And then we have the, the third thing that uh, I think a lot of us use, uh, and that is knowledge about the target audience, ideas about the target audience, and prejudice about the target <laughs> audience. And of course that works too, but that might not be perfect, the perfect way to only do this. Of course, if you've done a lot of them, you do have knowledge. But prejudice might work, might not work. You know. So, what do we want to know beforehand, before we start? What do we want to know about the target audience before we start making the game or adapting a game? Well, I, I put some up here that I find important to know about uh, this group. And first of all, I put playing experience. If someone has never played a game and doesn't even know what LARP is, you have a very different start from someone who's been LARPing for several years and tried a lot of different games. Age, well, you sort of, in my example in the beginning about this movie, age will, uh, will affect your game. If you have this age group, it will affect your game. And you can also use that to make a better game for them. A group security. It is, it is sometimes very hard to make a game for a group that is very insecure. When I'm talking about group, insecure, uh, group security, I don't really mean if the people in the group feel secure about themselves. I mean how the feeling in the group is. If the audience, for example, is a classroom who have a lot of disciplinary pro problems, who have someone who are uh, harassed in the class, and some people who uh, never speak up, and some people speak all the time, we have a, a, a very insecure group. And we can't do whatever with this group. We need to think about what we do with our game for this group. And, of course, why are they playing this game? Uh, engagement, ambition. I think that's an important. What, what, how ambitious are these? Could, could, I, could I put a lot of tasks on them before the game? Will, I make sure, will they read all the information I give them? If they don't have any engagement or ambition of, about this, they might just skip it and then your game won't work as well. Interests. Is this group really interested in something? Can I use that in my game? And something that is not a very important, or at least what I think is language, but of course it affects the game. 
For example, if we have uh, people coming from different native languages, and they're all speaking their second language, it could be hard to make a game that is very verbal and a lot of terms and things that uh, you need to sort of understand the words for it to be a good game. Maybe you have to design it differently. And it's also, we've done a lot of games where you have, once again, where you have, uh, like the whole group understands the language except one. What will I do with that one person? Uh, I think you can't just skip that and sort of go with the go with the native language and everyone except one will understand. You could design it so that will be an advantage in the game except instead of a, a disadvantage. Yes? Yeah, it's sort of related to language, but what about cultural differences? Have you ever done LARPs in like you know, classes with large minority groups or things like that? Do you have to adapt especially for that? That's a, a good question. I will write that up. Um, because what I want you to do now is that I would like you to work a little bit yourselves. I want you to sort of sit with the people next to you and try to find out more things that you should, you think it's highly important that you know about the audience when you're making a game. For them. So sit close to like three people next to you and talk about this for a couple of minutes and then we'll put down more of these in this list. Yeah. I think I think I think I think I Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
randomly going, sharing thoughts with me. Yes? Uh, we thought about uh, so what features creature, what also are important for, for creating a good audience for choosing. And we thought about that there is a social status of uh, people. So, contingent of a person, which, for example, if people are from uh, black uh, districts of New York, and uh, so this is one thing, if yeah, people uh, they are from, I don't know, Oxford College <laughs> students, and this is our, our, our other thing. Sort of uh, background I social status. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Plus. Yeah. Um, <laughs> English word for that. <laughs> uh, would it work for you to say class? Uh, like middle class. Um. But it doesn't it go beyond that though? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Your thoughts? But no, background covers it. Yeah. And there is also, I don't know if, it, if it's possible to, to know all the knowledge, so knowledge and information background of each personage and maybe his educational status. Yeah, I actually had that on my list in the beginning. I just found it sort of hard to to um, explain it a little bit. But I totally see your point because if it's a sort of a background knowledge about things that's going to be in the game, and you sort of need to know their level of that knowledge. I was very understand perfectly what you said. Yes. Okay. More. Yes. Um, which language you guys got on which sort of all different kind of um uh, uh information you know about individuals and it's like how do you think uh I guess what we came up with of course like um we need to know limitations of individual players to uh make the game a little bit. Yes. Uh I um, I told us your point. I'm also going to start, um, there's some things that you can know about your audience that will sort of make the framework of your game, that is sort of like, this game can be this long, for example, uh, because these players don't have that much time. We'll try to focus on the, the, the sign of it, but I, I can understand what you mean, and I'm going to write down limitations, uh, and it's, uh, it's a very big sort of... Very good. Yeah, I think that's a sort of a connected no. to this. Why? But Why um, it's more about motivation. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's connected to age too, but it doesn't doesn't need to be. <laughs> The reason why is to go together? Are there like a really a group group, or are just are there <coughs> individuals? I think it goes to group security. Part of it might go to interest. Yeah. Um, see, so yeah, I I'm thinking about a word for that. Group. Are they together by choice or by? Yeah, sense? exactly. Um, um, affinity. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah, group composition. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know the word affinity, so please explain the word to me. Just write how close you are to each other. Okay, yeah. 
Um, I think what I'm hearing from you is sort of the reason why you're, why you're a group. Not how the group is really, but the reason why they are a group. I think that will ex uh, sort of affect the group security, of course, but... Uh... <coughs> All right, we'll stop there. Um, of course, you have several more, and uh, I'm happy about it. But we'll, we'll just stop there, and of course, you can make a list when you're creating a game for a certain audience. What do you need to do for know for this audience? What would be good to know? And now I'm going to share some papers with you. You can step on that one. That one, okay. So I think it's 15, so you... Or how many? I mean like 20 or something. So if every second person takes one? that I actually need one myself, so I'm going to pick one up again. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so we're going to test this out. Uh, we're going to have a target audience, and we're going to test it out with the faders, uh, and where to put the faders, depending on what kind of target audience you have. But there's 11 faders, and I know that you haven't gone through all of them, so if you feel insecure about any of the uh, faders and none in your group will know anything about them, just focus on the one you've gone through. So what we're going to do is that we're going to, I'm going to uh, present a target audience, what you know about them, and then we're going to choose the four most important faders, the ones that you sort of need to be specific about what you put because this is important for this kind of uh, uh, target audience. And then we're going to try to put them somewhere where we think it will suit this target audience the best. And since I haven't been this here this week, I sort of invented my own system, and I'm so sorry if this totally collides with what, what you've been doing, but uh, we'll, we'll do it my way this time, and then you can translate it to your way. Uh, if you look at your paper, you have like fader one, uh, playing style, and then you have physical to verbal as sort of the fader where you come through. And physical, like if we gonna put this fader, you can say fader one, I want to put it at two, or fader one, I want to put it at five, and then it's very verbal. Physical one, very very physical. So this is sort of the levels you have to choose between one, two, three, four, five. And I did. Uh, one of, uh, I'm gonna start with the first target audience, and I'm gonna start with what I thought about that, uh, which four I chose as the most important, and where I put them. And then, uh, you're gonna try to tell me I'm wrong, and say where you would have put them. Or, you can tell me why I'm right, because that's also interesting. And, yeah, I'm going to present the target audience first, of course. The first target audience is a class. Uh, it's a class of 14-year-olds. They have never played before. They haven't chosen it by themselves, but according to the teacher, some in the class will love it. They are a quiet group and very motivated. So, I'm going to choose faders. And I'm going to put them somewhere. And I have cheated and thought about this beforehand. And hopefully I'll be writing this down because... No, I haven't. Okay. <laughs> then... Oh, I have. Oh, I have. I have chosen 
that some of the failures I would like to be very specific about where I put. I have put this up. The class. I have chosen to work with failure number one, playing style, physical or verbal. And I have put it at number two. That means quite physical. I have chosen to work with fader number five. That is character creation responsibility, organizer versus player. And I have put that at one. That means organizer, totally. And I have chosen fader number six. That is player motivation, competitive versus collaborative. I have chosen to put that at number two. That means quite competitive. And I have chosen <coughs> fader nine. And that is game master style. And I have put it at number two. So quite uh, active. And I know this is a fader you haven't gone through yet, but uh, uh, well. We'll, we'll talk more about it. Um, yeah. I've actually, I've, I've thought about choosing Fader 11, player pressure, but I thought that was very, um, for me, I thought that was so obvious that you would not put a hardcore pressure on these kind of players. So I chose not to use it because I was, uh, thought it was obvious. But, of course, that is a choice that might have been, should have been up here. So the class, 14-year-olds, um, no LARP experience. I'm not chosen to LARP. Okay, so I want you to talk like two and two. And I would like you to uh, come up with if you agree with me or if you disagree with me. And why you agree or why you disagree. Okay, so in your groups. Thank you. 
I was thinking about it a lot when I chose where to put it because I think also of course you should when it's a quiet or motivated group maybe you should sort of um, uh, challenge them to do something they usually don't do and this is a different setting to do this in and maybe they will sort of loosen their tongue in this kind of setting but why I choose it too is because uh, what I have seen uh, is that most times when there's new players who are, not, who are not experienced in LARPing, it's very hard to talk. It's very hard to have a discussion because it's, it's a lot of... Uh, 
people have been LARPing a lot, they don't really think about that, but, but when, when people have not LARPed before, and these are a lot of people who have not LARPed before, it is, it's hard to find out what, what am I supposed to talk about? And therefore we, we usually, or I usually choose to put in a lot of things that they can do, things that they can do with their body, because it's usually easier to sort of, um, sort of get into the role playing by doing stuff than to talk. So what should I say? And also with 14 year olds talking in front of a group is kind of scary. Or it's kind of scary for all of us, but it's, uh, it might be more so in when they're 14 year olds. Uh, disagrees. I would love to hear. I'm not right in all of this. I, I, I'm, I'm just making this up. So uh, please disagree with me. It was just my question before I heard that there was no about the for young players in an unexperienced place. It's hard to pronounce and their thoughts. But before I thought that uh, it would be vice versa, it would be um, easier for them if they are unexperienced markers to just um, maybe. Telling me some words, talking some words from the poems, from the books that they've read before, and so just uh, playing their role in a verbal way, just doing um, doing the role, like a, like a writing the poem, and not uh, so not being uh, so intrusive in, in this play because it's I thought it would be hard for them for the first time that I'm seeing it, and uh, I would I, I would have done for the play itself. Well, that would work too. I thought I, I, I'm not sure if I heard right, but I thought you said that if there's a like a movie or if you base it on sort of something they know a lot about. Exactly. Then I think they, that will be that work work very well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'd like to add, but I don't think that this is universal, but uh, teenagers are. Definitely in Sweden, maybe many other countries, but I have met teenagers from other countries where it's way more verbal than Swedish teenagers. So it might be that in one country it's very easy for the teenagers to make long speeches and very difficult for them to use their body. So it's not universally true. Of course, and that's uh, that almost should be up on that list. What you need to know, which which country are you working with, and the kind of culture differences that we're actually talking about too. We're gonna move on. I know that you have splendid ideas, but uh, since we have not so much time, we'll move on. I will explain uh, uh, all of these, what I thought about them, and then I will hear some more of your thoughts, and then we'll try out a new target group. Uh, feather, uh, fader, feather. Vader, number five, character creating responsibility. This might be a highly personal um, opinion, but I have, when, when first time I'm working with kids who's gonna be LARPing, they usually have no idea what they want to, what's playable as a character. Because it's very hard, you have never tried this before, and Usually, I think that people sort of figure out what LARP is after the first LARP. So before their first LARP, I usually find it that the, the game to get better and then to have more fun if the, you uh, choose for them. You put, put a character in their hands. But we have done some kind of things where you sort of choose what kind of game you want to have, what kind of things you want to do in the game. So we sort of arrange that they get sort of their interest into the character, the characters is put in that kind of action say they want to play out. Um, but also, of course, when you put a character in someone new's hands, they will feel a lot of pressure. Am I supposed to play this? Uh, I don't know how to do this. And what you need to uh, do is, of course, tell them that this is your character now. I've written sort of the backstory of it, but you can do whatever you would like with it. This is yours now. And then we have fader number six, player motivation, competitive versus collaborative. Here I fell for sort of like, okay, what, what do they know from beforehand? And most games they play are competitive. So it might be easier for them to get into the game if there's some competitive things in the games, like sort of solving a quest, because maybe a lot of 14 years olds have played computer games before, so they sort of know about solving quests, and then they know what to do so they feel more empowered to um, take on the game. 
And failure number nine. Uh, game master style, active versus passive. When you have, usually when people go to the first free time game, they come as their first time to a game where there's a lot of experienced players beforehand because you go to where there's a mixed background of players. When you play, uh, and then you can sort of watch a little bit what's happening before you start acting yourself and you can see how this is meant to be working out. But when you have 30, 14 year olds who have never played before and maybe only two game masters, the game masters need to be sort of active to show this is how you LARP. Because you see it by, by what other people do. You need a um, um, a role model. An example, a good example, yeah. Okay, agree or disagree? Yes. Uh, we, we agree on... On slide number five, we agree that it should be set to one, uh, the one about character creation responsibility. But we're not sure if that's the most important slider because we don't think you have that much room to uh, to actually move it. We think it's a bit given. If you're working with first-time developers, you have to make the roles for them, or at least make like a framework for making roles for them. So. We don't think it's that much option in the fader there, even if it's important to put it at one. Um, so we talked about uh, some others. Uh, we didn't agree uh, finally on something what to do in the end. I think fader number eight, plausibility, uh, could be important in an education setting. Uh, we haven't had this fader talk, but as I understand it, it's about uh, what's like realistic within uh, the LARP versus what creates a playable LARP. And I think in an education frame that's important because uh, you have to find the balance. You have to make a game that's playable, but at the same time there's a curriculum, there's some things they're supposed to learn and you can't move too far away from that. So you have to like find the correct balance there. I'm not sure where I would put the fader. It depends on uh, the game and what's the uh, goal of, of the LARP. But I think that's also something important to think about. I completely agree with you, uh, and, uh, and I definitely agree that the, the failure with the character is very small. Uh, at least what what's, uh, might be interesting, I don't know. Yeah. Um, okay, any more? Monica? Uh, we, well, we, were, we were already doing the more talk and less... Uh, uh, and a physical thing, and then when we came down to the uh, competitive versus collaborative, we suddenly had a lot of people that are competing at each other with words and not being comfortable with talking. So, so, so we were. I think for that, those two really connect in in, in what later uh, the game is going to be. So we, as we push the favor one more towards talking, we also kind of thought that we should push. From competing to collaborative uh, for these kids that are not, are not comfortable talking, it might be even harder to make them be verbal and compete at the same yeah, time. Yeah, feel that like you can fail with the. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so that's where our game is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Very relevant. Okay, we're going to move on to the next target group, and this time I won't give you what kind of faders I've chosen um, beforehand, but I will only give you a target group. And what I want you to do now, uh, after you've been given this uh, this target group, I want you to choose the four uh, four faders you think it's very important to work with uh, for this group, uh, and work with them, of course. And the next target group is the media team. A small but successful media company wants to try out LARP as a medium, as an art form. They want to try this kind of gaming. They are between the ages of 24 to 40 and have played a lot of kind of role playing games before, other kind of role playing games. Mainly computer based games, but some free form sort of. Uh, develop, developing your country, your company, sort of collaborative and trying to find out your roles in your group of games. Uh, they are very enthusiastic. They are like, yeah, yeah, let's do this, let's do this. This is your target audience. Choose the faders and where to put them.
Okay, finish up. And let's see, I would like when I ask for a hand raising, only one in the group raise their hand so I can count. How many have chosen faded number one? Well, only one in the group, so there will be just one hand from the group. One, two, three, four, five, six. Number two. Number three. <laughs> Four. Five. Seven. Ah, six. Uh, six. <laughs> Jumping ahead. One, two, three, some of yours. Uh, I choose number three <coughs> and th this is the first time I actually use this by the faders so I'm not saying I'm right I'm only speaking my mind here and then you can agree or disagree you choose. Uh, we're sharing. Uh, choose five, six and seven and I put them at one, three, five, and three. And now I'm going to change this one. I choose number three, scenographically. I wanted, I didn't say this to you, I should have told you, but um, if you're thinking outside like money or time wise, just doing something that's perfect for this group. I would li like to give them a 360 degree illusion because I thought that would be wonderful uh, because if they have sort of tried out computer games and it's very different clicking on a uh, computer then experiencing something physical yourself and seeing it and touching it. Um, I choose fader number five to uh, make it sort of in between because they were so enthusiastic so I would have liked to have sort of an open dialogue with the, the players about their characters and sort of being <coughs> both mixing with doing making them as an organizer and having them making them themselves. And I choose number six player most motivation and I choose very collaborative because they have they wanted to try out LARPing and one thing that I think is very interesting about LARP, the games at LARP as a game is that you could this collaborative thing about LARPing that you could do something fantastic together but it doesn't have to be competitive you can sort of create something it's it's very special for LARPing and since they wanted to try out LARP as a medium I wanted to sort of make them see what sort of something that they won't see in so many other games. Um, and I choose number seven, which is meta-techniques, because I thought about if they wanted to sort of try out the medium, I thought they might, if they want to use them themselves, maybe they want to be introduced to some kind of tools you can use. And then I wanted to sort of have some tools, but not too many, because it would sort of uh, not go so well with maybe my 360 degree solution. So, um, so I just put it in the middle. Okay, I would like to, if you sort of like this, I thought, I think this would be perfect for the group. Please uh, share your views, what you were discussing in your groups. Yes? I actually think that we should exactly the same players, and it's almost exactly the same. <laughs> think alike. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've, I didn't convince my partner, but uh, I think I would. One. So I would go uh, on Twitter too. 
which is abstraction versus realism, I would take maximum by abstraction because they like if they're journalists, at least in Denmark, they will have seen the forest cases, they will have seen the World of Warcraft where huge groups of people from just like uh, and then the scenography of the history, uh, I went for the complete opposite again. Oh, nice. So, like, a room with a fox or a tape game, uh, because of the same argument, they would have seen, and, and I think they would be able to think that people go to the castle and have, have that experience, to, so to show the different environment <coughs> where it connects more to you. Uh, in favor seven, with the mixing mix, if they're inclusive or exclusive, I would go completely inclusive. Um, and the bleed-in, uh, bleed-out, or deciding close to home, or not, I would go close to home, but I have to play like a mix of technique, tape game about journalists, so they all uh, get, get the most type <coughs> and give them like a shocking welcome to work. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. I think it's fantastic. I would also like to do that. Uh, maybe you should do both games and then just see the complete uh, and how diverse it could be. Uh, yes, I'm having you should, uh, not so much time, so I'm going to wrap this up. And uh, I'm going to say that I chose to work uh, with this adapting the target audience with this kind of mixing table uh, idea. Of course, you should think about content ad adaptation, that what do you put into your game, what kind of content do you put into your game. Thinking about the movie together, our teenagers, they didn't know anything about the content, so they couldn't play on that. Before and after adaptation, what do you do before the game and after the game depends on what kind of audience you have, of course. And what I would like you to sort of have your eyes fixated on is that isn't there, it isn't always the best idea to do the game that you find interesting if the target group is different from you. Sort of have, of course you should go do games that you find interesting, but you should do it sort of also with the idea of what kind of audience are you with. Because that's uh, kind of hard. We have like, uh, can, maybe I can give you some questions. One. <laughs> Does anyone have a question? <laughs> There's also, I wanted to ask about the difference between relations when you work, for, uh, when you create a LARP, a LARP uh, when you ask to, to create specific LARPs for specific people, uh, it's like a relation of uh, service, not art. Uh, how is it diff different experience and uh, it, it's evaluated differently by the players as well. Uh, could you? Yes, it's a big question. Uh, briefly, I would say it's very different uh, from making because it's sort of they know why they want to do it, uh, and they know the group they want to do it for, and we have a budget. So it's a very fixate framework. Uh, but what we have discovered is that don't tell, don't let people that don't know LARP tell you how to do it, because they won't know how to do it. They will know what they want to gain from it. They will know what, what target they want to reach. But we know the method. So always be aware of the, you're the artist, you're the LARP right, or whatever you want to call yourself. You know how to do it in the best manner. So that's sort of this one. Uh, I think I only had one question, so I'm going to step down. Thank you very much. like one, three, five, seven, etc. And they will stay here on the stage. 
And the second group that have the even numbers, like two, four, six, uh, they will go, they will meet in the uh, hall. And then, what's your group? group to the left. Lecture group on the left. And then after one hour, you have like five minute breaks, and then groups will switch. Yeah, the group from the stage will go to the lecture group on the left. And now we have like five minutes break for the coffee. Then you can grab your coffee and go to your groups. <laughs> Thank you. 